you're not going to believe this. And I wouldn't blame you because if I told you this story, that once upon a time, on a little island somewhere way off in the sea, there lived a race of teeny people not known to science. They lived with elephants the size of ponies. They hunted dragons that spat poisonous saliva laced with botulism and anthrax. You'd say, come on. But here's the thing. An international team of paleoanthropologists think that this story may be true. And tonight we're gonna to show you evidence that suggests that these little people may have existed on our planet for tens of thousands of years, and even more intriguing, there's the outside chance they may still be around. Midway between Asia and Australia, here in Indonesia, lies the island of Flores. For centuries, the people who lived here told tales of little hairy people. Well, they talk about being scared of three things. One is elephants, one is tigers, and one is the little people of the forest. These small people, maybe a metre tall, hairy, with sloping foreheads, thick eyebrow ridges and no chin, and they used to come up to the village, they used to raid their crops, uh, until one day they stole a baby and that was it. The villagers decided to chase them out of their cave, which was the last they saw of what they call the Ibu Gogo, which is translated as the grandmother who eats everything. Ibu Gogo. Learned people, scholars, dismiss these tales as folklore, but then a team of Australian archaeologists digging in this cave, Liang Bua it's called, discovered something simply astounding. At first they thought it was a child. I thought it was a young child because the skeleton was very, very small. Um, the individual was about a meter tall. About the size of a modern three-year-old. But then they looked more closely at the skull. The lines on top here would be different if it was a child's skull further apart. And the teeth, this was no child. It's in fact an adult. The wear and tear on the teeth shows that this um, individual was an adult, probably aged about 30. Um, it was a female. We already knew she was very, very small. So and then we knew he had something quite unusual. Unusual is an understatement. Jared Diamond is a scientist, an author, to me, when I heard of this, I immediately said to myself, this is the most amazing discovery in any field of science in at least the last 10 years. That big? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because it's the most drastically different human that existed in the last million years. Just to give you a taste for this, I am about six feet tall. Now here, this is what a full-grown pygmy looks like, 24-year-old adult pygmy. Let's check it out about four and a half feet tall. And here is Homo floresiensis. And let's check this. <laughs> a little over three feet tall. That's about one half my size. It's the smallest human species ever identified anywhere in the world from any time. Wait a second, says this well-respected Indonesian anthropologist. Teku Jakob says, I think she's one of us, our species, but with a rare disease. Therefore, yes. Mm. A small brain, microencephaly. Microencephaly can severely retard growth in modern people, so she's one of us with a growth disease. I'm sure about it, yeah. Well, you're wrong, said the Australian team. There's no chance at all that it's a, a, a pathologically deformed individual of our species. Welcome to paleoanthropology. <laughs> So since the debate here is highly technical, I visited Ralph Holloway, one of the world's preeminent ancient skull experts. Smaller than this? Less than many chimpanzees. And since he's got a cast of the lady skull, I asked him, well, does it look like our species, like Homo sapiens? This is a human being. Are these new creatures that you've seen, do they look like this? Or are they, no. They're, they're different in some fundamental way? Absolutely. Ralph has examined this cast of her brain cavity, and it's not like ours, he says. It's low. It's broad. You're sure of this? Absolutely. So what we may have here is a brand new flavor of human. But if we do, how'd this creature get so small? The Australians believe that Homo floresiensis descends, as we do, from the original, earlier human, Homo erectus, who came out of Africa and spread to Europe and Asia. But as best scientists can tell, Homo erectus probably wasn't advanced enough to build boats. So how'd they get to the island? 
Jared theorizes that early humans reached Flores by a land bridge. All this was going on during the ice ages when around the world a lot of water was locked up in glaciers so sea level was low. So what today is water then was land. You could have walked there conceivably. No, you couldn't walk there but the water gaps were narrower. Those gaps were so narrow it didn't take much to swim or float across. Other creatures did. Elephants did it, monkeys did it. If monkeys could do it, why couldn't these dumb humans do it? But after they got there, he says, the ice age ended, glaciers melted, the ocean rose, and these early humans were stranded. And this may explain why they got so small. They get small on an island where there are no major predators and where there are not that many nutrients. So you really don't want to be eating any more than you need to if you want to survive. So for reasons of avoiding starvation, it, it's more efficient to keep small. So you're not surprised then that this group of human types could become very small. There are lots of big animals that arrive on small islands, and then over evolutionary time they shrink on, shrink in size. There are islands where instead of hippos, there are pygmy hippos. Instead of buffalo, there are pygmy buffalo. Instead of elephants, there are elephants one-eighth normal scale. So maybe people landed on Flores and they got smaller too, one-half our size. The amazing thing though, is their brains were a third our size. Small, small, small. Oh, small, you know, that's under chimpanzee. And here it is associated with supposedly sophisticated stone tools. What the hell have they found? The evidence is showing us that something with such a little brain may have been more capable of doing a lot more things than we originally thought. The Australians say that they found at the cave site traces of campfire, so the little people may have been cooking with fire. They found stone tools nearby that may or may not belong to them, but they looked pretty sophisticated. And remember, these people hunted and ate dwarf elephants. So here's one getting up. Check out the sharp tusks. And look at this one's tusks. And, say the paleontologists, they did okay hunting and eating formidable prey because not all island species get small. Warm-blooded animals shrink on islands. Cold-blooded animals often expand on islands to fill the niche left by lions and tigers that could not get out there. The evidence suggests little people ate Komodo dragon. And these guys weigh in at what? Up to 500 pounds, but it's, it's worse than that. Because back then, apparently, Komodo dragons were even bigger. And if you get near their mouths, you, you see that spit? It's spit that contains botulism, bacteria, and anthrax, and other things that you would not want to get infected by. Really nasty bacteria. So most likely, if you're three feet tall, you'd want to hunt these animals in groups. Would that, in your sense, require some kind of signaling or language or, watch out, Joe, Absolutely. here comes the lizard. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I tend to be in that camp. Yeah, I really do think that, you know, communal hunting and so forth has to involve, you know, language. Language, tools, technology, maybe the little people did all that. But if they did it with brains a third our size, those brains would have been very different, radically different. And that may be one of the great lessons of this, if it turns out. You know, it may tell us, hey... Oh, you're suggesting that maybe this brain is organized differently so it can do more in a little space. Oh, it's definitely organized differently. And it may have done more in a little bit of space, absolutely. And if that's true, brain scientists would have a whole new model for human intelligence, and that's huge. Meanwhile, back at the cave site, the Australians say they've discovered fragments from seven additional individuals. All they claim appear to be little people. But the biggest shock was yet to come, the age of these remains. Paleontologists say the first Homo erectus creatures arrived on Flores something like 800,000 years ago. So scientists figured, well, then these skeletons will be old. Um, we're all expecting it to be maybe 60, 100,000 years old. But when they aged these bones, one sample was only 18,000 years old. In paleontology, that's like the day before yesterday. The fact that it came out at 18,000 um, was pretty much a shock to everybody. A shock because that means these little people were alive during, well, modern times. We know that modern humans have been in, in that area for at least 50,000 years. So if you do the math, little people and big people shared this island for over 30,000 years. 
final question that everybody is too shy to ask is, well, uh, uh, um, did we or didn't we have sex with them? Because if little people became a different species, they branched away from humans and couldn't have babies with us and wouldn't want to. My bet is we did not have sex with them, and here's my reasoning. I would have predicted that they would have been really nasty, just like any humans would be really nasty. Because looking at the other things, like, this is an other. I don't know why he's doing this. That's right. That's right. To test this, you'd want to analyze the little people's DNA. And then we can compare their DNA with our DNA, and we'll have a case for whether we may or may not have interbred as we came through Southeast Asia on our way through to Australia. So what happened to the little people of Flores? It looks like they were wiped out, along with those little elephants they were hunting, by a major volcanic eruption on the island about 12,000 years ago. Or, and this is not impossible, could the Ibu Gogo still exist? No. That's one view, here's another. I did have somebody speak to me, a geologist, and he didn't want to be named because, of course, he felt like if he told people he'd seen little people, people would think he'd seen aliens or something like that. So at the moment, we are going to follow these stories of an actual cave where they may have been living, and we, we do intend to go and excavate this actual cave. Folklore has it that they, they just simply ran over the volcano nearby and disappeared further west. So perhaps in some other part of Flores they might still be living. It's not outrageous, but it's highly improbable. But it would be worth looking just in case that did happen to be the case. Well, as we all know, it is finally springtime. So, uh, before we go, I wanted to celebrate the season and I can think of no better way than to introduce you to a creature who is again very, very small and lives down here somewhere uh, close to the ground doing things that I think you will find very surprising. Here's the thing about North American wood frogs. They're small. So it might be very difficult to spot a frog. Very small, but they're everywhere, just out of view, hiding on the forest floor. Nothing. He's, he's camouflaged. His coloration is the same as the soil around him. You see him here? He's cold. You can find them here in southern Ohio and all the way up to the Arctic Circle. But wherever they are, once it gets cold with the first sprinkle of ice, this frog does something I didn't know was possible. As soon as the frog touches, just touches an ice crystal, this animal is going to freeze. Freeze, freeze? Freeze, solid freeze. That touch of ice immediately sets off signals inside the frog, says Professor John Costanzo, that pulls water away from the center of its body so the frog's internal organs are now wrapped in a puddle of water that then turns to solid ice. I, I, I still can't get over it. It's really an amazing, amazing thing. There is no breathing, no kidney function. The heart stops. And there will be no heartbeat for a long period of time. You mean as in no heartbeat? Right. Nothing. Flatline. Flatline? For an hour or two? It could be for days, perhaps even weeks. Really? It sounds like it's virtually dead, no? We know that the frog isn't dead, but he's probably about as close as you can get. To being dead? Yes. <laughs> So, from the outside, this little frog feels like a rock. Except that as it froze, the frog flooded itself with a kind of sugar. The frog's blood sugar is distributed through the circulatory system. It works like an antifreeze. It's harder for the water to freeze, so cells stay just damp enough for the animal to hold itself together. Until the springtime. When the days grow a little longer, and the ground gets a little warmer. And then, well, a kind of miracle happens. After weeks or months of no heartbeat, none, suddenly, there's a pulse. And that first heartbeat leads to another, and then another. And then within a day, and in the case of this little frog, it took about mm, 10 hours, the animal literally comes back to life. It's 
spontaneous resumption of function. Why? We don't know. We don't know what triggers that event. And think how elegant a business this is. Because although the sun is warming up the outside of this little guy, somehow his insides, his heart, his brain, they thaw first. His insides warm up before his outsides. But somehow it all happens in perfect synchrony every spring. Yes, and it's going to undertake a very energetic activity. It's mating time. You mean hours after it thaws, it's going to do it with a lady? It's going to perform. Uh-huh. <laughs> what an animal. Can we say that on I TV? don't know whether we can or not. <laughs> well, we just did. Thank you.